I'm trying. Uh, the, the first question I wanted to ask you tonight after, after seeing the play in production for the first time is, when you and I first talked, you said that your primary ambition, as I recall, as a playwright, was to have people leave the theater having seen your plays talking about them. What do you want people to talk about when they leave after seeing Question of Words? Well, I, uh, I don't ever write a play in order to provide answers to uh, life's questions or to the things that we think about a lot. I, I rather provide plays that create questions or add, <laughs> add to the questions we've already got so that you think more deeply about the issue. So for me, this is about relationships. Each of my plays has a general theme to it, and this is obviously about relationships. And you've got two people who know how to use words, who understand the power of words. In one case, eloquent words, and in another case, street language. But both of them are very powerful in their own way, and they bridge the gap. I mean, life is a question of words. We, we need to choose our words carefully, but we can accomplish great things. They don't have to be poetic words, nor do they always have to be street language, but if we choose our language carefully, we can accomplish amazing things just with words. How does, um, how does the play comment for you, or what were you trying to comment on in terms of the connection between connection and language, or relationship and the possibility of love and language? Well, again, I think that we're, we don't, realize how powerful a simple phrase can be. And as a result, I think we need to think more about what we're saying to each other. But we also need to realize that we both, as individuals in a relationship, you grow up in different lives. And so words mean different things. And phrases have a different level of power. And so in order to truly understand what another person is thinking and feeling, you are not really listening to the words as they come across in a dictionary sense, but you're listening to the connotation. And if you don't understand, then you need to pursue that. It's not just the denotation or the dictionary meaning of a word that's the most powerful. Usually it's the connotation of a word that's the most powerful. And if we recognize that, we, we can step back and say, wait a minute, what did you mean? Until you get at the real issue. Is there something I don't want to say contrived, but something put on the characters, and is particularly towards the end of the play, do you think, where there's a level of honesty that we don't normally encounter, or people normally don't engage into the level that's being portrayed here for you, or do you feel it was very real? Do you feel it's very realistic? No, it isn't. That's why there's so many unhappy people. The, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that's the way we should talk to each other. So I'm encouraging that by presenting a scenario that I don't think is unrealistic, or or impossible, it's just difficult. Unusual. Yeah. yeah. The one thing that occurred to me tonight that I have to ask you about, too, is, is almost a personal question, personal to you. Do you, is there a part of Richard Manley that wants to act the way Derby does and just pick up the phone and hang it up on people? Or, or do you actually do that in your, in your real life? Anybody here that knows me? Uh, <laughs> anybody here I owe money to? Uh, yes, I do that sometimes. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, I am very much like Derby, and uh, so there's an antisocial aspect to my life, and there's certainly a, a hermit-like aspect to my personality. Uh, but, yeah, I tend to be a recluse. One of the things I thought about after doing the interview that was published on the website with you is, and I revisited the play before I came to see it, and I didn't read the whole thing, but I, I'm wondering to what extent for you this is a... Uh, mm, sort of getting back, if you will, at the aspects of the advertising and marketing and design industry that you didn't like. <laughs> that most of us wouldn't like. Mm, yeah, this is part of that. Yeah. The, the, well, the, the, character, the two main characters are both me. Uh, I came out of that world. My, I have a business career behind me. And when I started writing plays seven years ago, just about when Derby disappeared, uh, I... I have been an avid reader, have been an avid reader all my life, of poetry and philosophy and literature. And those two um, identities were sometimes in conflict in the advertising business. So I had my own company, so I had a chance to, to uh, pick my clients and to pick my, my projects. So I had a little bit more control. But in essence, the creativity of the advertising business or the copywriting business 
is solving someone else's problem, whereas the creativity in a, writing a play is expressing something that you feel strongly about. So there's, there's, I used to think when I got into the business, because I've always wanted to be a writer, well, the copywriting would be the next, it would be a short step to creative writing. And I was very wrong. Um, so, yes, I did, I raised some of the issues that used to bother me in the play. Not necessarily to get back at them, uh, I had a good time, but certainly some of the absurdity uh, in, the, in the business I, I took shots at. Well, something you said earlier, and I think it connects to, to your answer to that last question. It's interesting to me, um, and this is true, I think, with, you know, educated, you know, intelligent people sort of universally. Both of these people are very much of their worlds, in their worlds. They will, they, to one extent or another, they believe in their worlds, but they're also at the same time, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ambivalence there. They're, they're alienated at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they're both aware of the other's world. And there's a certain, I don't know what to call it, uh, antipathy or fear or, or something. They make fun of each other's worlds a little bit. Him, Derby more than, yeah. than, than uh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Mary. Um, <laughs> and certainly the mother does. But what, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, to what extent is that awareness of the other and the opposite, um, particularly when it comes to language, important here and important to you? I think it's very important. I think Mary, uh, as is mentioned in the play, she came out of a, a great education and she decided to go into advertising because there was a lot more money in it. And, and yet she knew on some level the power of, of eloquence and she appreciated language. She just hadn't, didn't have any use for it and she wasn't around people who cared that much. Part of what I, was, what I was getting at by making Derby a bit more pretentious than she was is a, it's a problem I have with poetry and, and and the humanities to some degree in society, in that we put much of our great literature on a pedestal, and we don't encourage our, ourselves as a culture to embrace poetry, to grow up with it, to appreciate it. And so I was, to some degree, taking a stab at that, in that I believe both fine art as well as, as poetry is something that should be part of our culture, the way it is so many other cultures, and not something that we should be afraid of, and you have to wear a, a black beret in order to read poetry. Uh, I think that I want to break that stereotype down because I know how much it's meant, meant to me. And so I, I made him a, a bit more fallible when it came to that. Yeah, that's the, to me, the wonderful phenomenon of poetry slams. Yes. With the ghetto kids doing it. Right. Yeah, it's just, it's just great. Um, one question I had that came up for me tonight, um, I'm looking it here too, by the way. Uh, but one question that came up for me tonight was how do you feel? that the, I don't want to call it a subplot, but the, the appearance of the plot with Max and his, his daughter Sarah and the connection between her and Derby and him and Derby, mm -hmm. how do you feel that comments on, on the main relationship between Mary and Derby? Well, it gives us a chance through Max to learn a little bit more about Derby. In fact, there's a question I, I wanted to ask the audience, and that is, how many of you thought when when Max first said, oh, that would be one fine coincidence, and then later he says, oh, you taught it, you taught my daughter. Did any of you, just with a raise of hands, think that you were about to discover something bad about Derby? Yeah? Good. That's, that's what I was after. I, I, ambiguity, I think, can be a lot of fun in the play, but it also can, can keep you engaged, because you think, you think aha, I, I didn't know where that was going. What's going to happen next? Um, it allowed me, well, there's it it, several things going on. When I began to work on this play, when I first had the idea for it, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And probably some critics would say that hasn't changed, but the, <laughs> uh, I didn't come out of a, a, a background, I didn't come out of schooling that taught me how to write plays, and taught structure and, and what have you. I just loved language, I'd seen a lot of plays, I'd read a great deal of literature, and I just began experimenting. Normally I start with a couple of characters I think it was Petter who said, I put two people in a room and see what happens. There's a degree of that when I start writing plays. And so I was just experimenting with farce, with comedy, and with drama, because I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. And, and so I created this subplot, partly as a way to get at, at Mary's sense of humor, partly, partly to get at the deepness of, of knowledge and concern that existed with Derby. As, we talk, as he talks about uh, Max's daughter, we I think we get to like him even more. 
and we realized just how important words are and the fact that he can relate to other people. So it was a tool for that, but it was also just fun um, in that I played with those characters and created a second a play within the play, so to speak. In thinking about it, the other plays of yours that I've, that I've seen and read, I think almost all of them now, almost four or five, four of the five, um, it, it, I was thinking about this today that you, more than many playwrights, um, don't leave room for, and I'm going to say an actor in a certain sense, and maybe one of you can comment on this, to come up with their own backstory. Your characters very much, very much to, my, to my way of thinking, are pretty much well provided to the audience, who they are, where they came from, what they've done. There's no mysteries in their background that aren't revealed. Mm -hmm. Is that something you think about, or is purposeful, and, and does it serve a purpose for you? It's, uh, it, it's not something that I'm consciously doing, so if it happens... Would you agree to that? I think so, but it would be... Actually, that's a good question for the actors. I, yeah. I don't know. Anybody? I would actually disagree with it. Okay. I mean, not, well, in the fact that, I mean, there's always... There's always background that you find that you sometimes discover throughout the rehearsal process, and sometimes you invent to get to a certain place uh, that you're trying to get to. But uh, yeah, there's always little nuances that you you develop and you think and you, you live uh, in the background. At least that's me. I'm Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it continues. That's one of the joys of live theater. Is every night it's different because each one of us comes to the theater each night with a different day behind us, which informs our relationship to our character. And it changes all the time. If Roy gives me something different between, uh, during that scene, it, it changes our interaction, just like it does in real life. So he gives us a good framework. I agree with it there. But to make characters three-dimensional, um, you need to bring something to them. You need to fill out the nice framework that Richard has provided and, us. And actually, it is a beautiful framework. I mean, it, it is it is impressive. It seems to me it's, it's a little more detailed and more extensive than many new playwrights today. Oh, it was it was incredible to work with these characters. They're so much fun. It's and such a big responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Mary, did you, did you have to work on uh, much of the backstory uh, that, yeah. you, that you felt? What was that about for you? <laughs> well, um, I needed to do a lot of discoveries about um, when I felt um, she was affected by Derby, why she was affected that way, what was her relationship with her father, um, and other men, you know, has she been married before, or, or anything like that. So um, it really informed my uh, choices in how um, Derby and his appearance in my life Lydia, I want to ask you too, how did you feel pulling this together in the sense of what these actors are saying now, working with Richard, a play, I mean, I, I was thinking about, it. I'm sorry, how a director um, is sort of challenged by, I mean, we're here in the theater, it is all about the words to some extent, and yet here's a play about words, it, it's, it sort of becomes this exponential thing, I th and I thought, this is somewhat of a director's dilemma, how did you approach that? were in conversation early on about some of the words. Um, one of the things I wrote Richard in an email is that a lot of my audience uh, gets turned off if there is a god in front of the damned, and if the, uh, the word fuck is used too much. So we negotiated some adjustments on that. And uh, I, yeah, I said, personally, I'm fine with it. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> but we've had instances where, even with a PG-13 for language, we've got letters to the editor complaining that Camelot's not a safe place to take your family. So we negotiated that, and those are you know, certain words that I know because I used to work with a Christian homeschool group are triggers. And what I wanted to do was make sure, I love the language in this play, I love the poetry, and I wanted to make sure that we were able to uh, open the tent as opposed to close it. But with each of the actors, you know, it, there again you go back to who is, which is the essence of each of these people that, that I cast in these roles and what can they bring to the characters that Richard has created. 
And uh, to me, it was a lot of fun to have these two who are married finally play opposite each other again since Brigadoon, which was the first time they played opposite each other when they weren't married. Very different couple, though. Very, 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 very different. Um, and, and, and so to, to bring everything that they bring to the stage as an actor and then combine it with what Richard has, the framework, as Pam put it, that Richard has provided, it was a pleasure. Not always easy, you know. Um, with a couple of the actors, this really touched home, hit home, and so they had to work on some of the stuff that was getting in the way of being true to the character. But yeah, you do that in almost every show you do. I, want, I do want to give uh, our audience a chance to ask some questions, but I, I, one one last thing that I wanted to ask you about, and this is sort of off topic of this play, but. You, I think, as much as any new playwright that I've read through at AMPF, bring what I would call a New York sensibility. Um, it's, it's sophisticated, um, but it has a certain edge to it that we associate, or I associate with New York. You're now moving to California. <laughs> which, which is, I, although I wasn't born there, it is the greatest state in America. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you believe, you feel that it could or would change how you write and what you write with. No, I don't think it will. I, uh, I, I think we both, my wife and I both, consider ourselves New Yorkers um, in many different ways. But California and the West Coast, I mean, the West Coast and the East Coast are our favorites by far uh, for the weather, for the belts, a long list. But the, my motorcycle is out here. <laughs> the, um, but no, I, I think that. Um, Maybe it's a New York sensibility. I think it's different. I think it's, it's a way of looking at life. And maybe we associate it with New York, but I don't think it's purely New York. Um, and I, I think some of that is that we've lived in many places in the course of our lives, uh, both Europe as well as here. And I think we come away with what might be called a New York sensibility, but I don't think it necessarily is. One thing I wanted to mention quickly, because it, it happened, uh, I found out last month, the uh, monologue that Mary gives in the hall uh, where she tells Derby what this poem meant uh, regarding her, her grandmother and what have you, and she goes on for a while. That, that's considered a monologue, um, even though it's delivered to someone else. And it was just chosen for a book that's going to be published by Smith and Krauss called The Best Women's Stage Monologues of 2015. Wow.